السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم I welcome every single one of you to our second session in the explanation of the book Umdatul Fiqh by the great scholar of Islam, the Hanbali scholar Ibn Qudama Rahimahullah. Walhamdulillah, last week we began with this book. We had gone through the biography of the author. We had learned that he begins his book with a chapter and the book of Tahara. Why the book of Tahara? This gives us an indication that according to majority of the scholars, the most important precondition of Salah is your purification, as opposed to the Maliki scholars who are of the opinion that the most important precondition is, is time. We had also seen that he began with the Bab Ahkam al Mia, the chapter of the rulings of water. Why water first? Because water is this most important substance that you would use for your purification, for your wudu, for your ghusl, for the removal of najasat. We had learned that Ibn Qudama rahimahullah, and the Hanbali Madhab and majority of the scholars divide water into three categories. Number one, Tahur, water which is in its natural form, water of the ocean, water of rain, water in the lake. And then he had a division called water which is Tahir. This water could be the remaining water which drops off from your limbs when you perform wudu or when you take a ghusl. And what is the ruling with regards to this type of water? Ibn Qudama states that you cannot use this for your purification, for your wudu or your ghusl. You could drink it, you could wash your car with it, you could water your garden, all of that is fine. It's not najis, but it does not have the property of removing hadith from yourself. It does not have this property of being a purifier of other objects. And the third category, the category of najis water, which would be when it changes in color, taste or smell by something which was najis. We have mentioned that this was the opinion of the Hanbali Madhab, but rather we stated that the stronger opinion in this matter is the opinion of the Maliki scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, a narration from Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal himself and many of the contemporary scholars, and that is that water is divided into only two categories. Water which is Tahir and Tahur, and water which is Najis. Tahir and Tahur are one category. For as long as water can be called water, then you use it for your purification. Without any differentiation between two Qullatain, or less than Qullatain, more than Qullatain, water is water until proven otherwise. For as long as you can point, this is water, you use it, walhamdulillah. When it turns in color, taste or smell by something which is najis, then it's najis and you cannot smear your body with najasa. When it changes in color, taste or smell by something which is tahir, like for example tea bags, like for example Coca-Cola or orange juice, then you cannot use it for your purification, not because it's najis, but rather because it is now not water any longer. Alhamdulillah. We also had spoken about the matter of removal of najasa. Removal of najasa. Is it a condition that I have to use water? That was what the opinion of the author as has been stated. And the opinion of the Hanbali Madhab. But we had learned that there is a narration from Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and a narration in the Madhab that whatever means you used to remove this najasa, if the eye of the najasa if all traces of the najasa have been removed, then walhamdulillah, it is now tahir. The object is now cleaned. And we discussed various proofs, example, istijmar, the usage of toilet paper, etc. in our sharia is something which is permissible. Purification achieved by other than water. We spoke about, for example, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that when you come for salah, check your shoes. If it has filth on it, then wipe it and then pray in it. Purification achieved by other than water. So we deferred with the author and we said that purification when it comes to removal of najasa can be achieved by other than water. We also spoke about the matter with regards to how many a times 
do I have to wash this area to remove the najasa? The baby has urinated on its garments. Do I have to wash the garment once, twice, thrice, seven times? Is there a minimum number? Is there a maximum number? With regards to maximum, there is no maximum. With regards to minimum, then the author has stated you have to wash it minimum three times. Even if the najasa was removed by the first wash, you wash a second time and you wash a third time because that's the minimum amount of washes you have to wash. We deferred with the author and we said that as long as all traces, eye of najasa have been removed, alhamdulillah, it suffices. Proof. We had seen that the Messenger وسلم, said to the companions that pour over the urine where this Arabi, this Bedouin had urinated in the masjid, pour over that area a jug of water. Prophet وسلم, never specified a specific number. The female with regards to menstrual blood on her garment, Messenger وسلم, ordered her to wash it and he did not mention any specific number. We also differed with the author with regards to washing the utensil seven times if the swine, the pig, had drunk from your utensil. The author made piyas. If the dog, you wash seven times, then the pig is also very filthy, and so the same applies. And we differed with the author on this. We said we stick to the text in this matter, and we do not make piyas. The author discussed the matters pertaining to najasa, example, blood. Example, madhi, pre-cum. The other examples could be feces and urine. That small amounts of this najasa are overlooked. If it's on your garment, a little bit of najasa, then it's overlooked. And if you prayed your salah, your salah would still be valid. Walhamdulillah. We spoke about semen, human semen, and we had learned, according to the Hanbali Madhab and the majority of the scholars, Semen is something which is tahir, it is the base of mankind. It is from that which even the Anbiya have been created. And we saw that Aisha anha would scrape it off the garment of the Messenger wasallam. Lastly, we discussed the matter pertaining to the urine and the feces of animals which are halal for us to consume. And we learned that the urine and feces of such animals is also tahir and not najis. We spoke about the issue of when you have doubt, then you resort back to yaqeen. Al yaqeenu la yazulu bi shak. Certainty is not removed by by doubt. Will that be idnillahi taala? We take in this session bab al aniya. Now that I know the rulings pertaining to water, what if my water is found in a golden type of utensil, a gold jug? What if my water is found in a leather sack? And this leather sack could have been from a halal animal, could have been from a halal haram animal. What type of leather would be permissible? The rulings pertaining to utensils will now be discussed bi idnillahi ta'ala. Take note that the general rule is that all types of utensils are permissible until proven otherwise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah states, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created for you everything on the earth. For you it has been created. That's the general rule. And that's Surah Baqarah verse number 29. Everything on earth, every type of utensil, it is permissible until proven otherwise. Now we move on. Bab al-Aniya. The author states, لا يجوز استعمال آنية الذهب والفضة في طهارة ولا غيرها. لما روى حذيفة أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا تشربوا في آنية الذهب والفضة ولا تأكلوا في صحافهما فإنها لهم في الدنيا ولكم في الآخرة وحكم المضبب بهما حكمهما إلا أن تكون الضبة يسيرة من الفضة The author states It is not lawful to use gold and silver vessels, utensils in purification, jugs, cups, whatever it might be, or otherwise, like eating and makeup and all other types of uses. So the author states, gold and silver utensils for males and females, not allowed. And also, all other types of uses. 
That is because of the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Do not drink in gold or silver vessels and do not eat in dishes made out of them For they are for them, the disbelievers in this world and for you in the hereafter This ruling, general for males and females, a golden jug, a golden spoon, a silver cup Males and females from amongst the Muslims, we are not allowed to use them at all and then the author states, also other types of usages. Maybe a brother, he wants to have a golden cupboard. Maybe someone has a golden pen. Maybe it is a golden vase. So I'm not using it, but I have it on display. A silver frame. All these types of uses, the author states, they are not permissible at all. Why? Because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تشربوا, do not drink. In utensils of silver and gold. Do not eat in those plates. For verily it is for the disbelievers in this world and for you in the Akhirah. So, the text explains. Eating and drinking, haram for males and females. What about other uses? Well, the Hanafis, the Shafi'is, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, majority of the scholars, they are of the opinion, if we are not allowed to eat in them, which is a common means of usage, if we're not allowed to eat in gold and silver utensils, then definitely all other types of usages will also be haram. Min bab awla, definitely. If this is haram, then that one has more right to being haram. If you're not allowed to say you to your parents, off, then definitely hitting your parents is something which is haram to a greater extent. So if you are not allowed to eat and drink in silver utensils, according to majority of the scholars, then having it in your toilet, having it as a vase, as a frame, would, e would be even haram to a higher extent and higher degree. So a jewelry bag, a, a gold casket, etc. All of this would be haram for the male and for the female. The exception given for the female is jewelry. She is allowed to wear jewelry of silver, of gold, no problem whatsoever. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, that silk and gold, they are haram upon the males of my ummah. As for the females, permissible for females. And as we mentioned, this is the ruling with regards to majority of the scholars. Yes, there were scholars, minority amount of scholars, who were of the opinion that other types of usages would be permissible. But eating and drinking, then they are not allowed. And the Ahwat opinion, the safer opinion, la shak, no doubt, is the opinion of majority of the scholars, eating, drinking, all other types of usages, gold and silver, we would stay away from them. There is a bit higher concession given when it comes to silver, as we will see. وَحُكْمُ الْمُضَبَّ بِهِمَا حُكْمُهُمَا إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ الْفِضَّةِ يَسِيرَةً إِلَّا أن تكون إلا أن تكون الفضة يسيرة إلا أن تكون الضبة يسيرة من الفضة. And then he says the ruling of vessels which were sold in the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he had a vessel he had some sort of dish some sort of jug and it was cracked it was broken on one side. So the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم had the soldered with silver. So the author says this مضبة the soldering. If you need to correct your vessel, then it would be permissible to use silver in the matter just for soldering. So, you're using silver because of a need. Number two, you are using very small, minute amounts of silver. This would be permissible. And the hadith that the Messenger وسلم, used that amount of silver for the soldering of his vessel, it is recorded by Imam Al-Bukhari. Then the author continues allowable vessels, those vessels which are permissible for us to make use of. And all other types of utensils, which are tahir, which are clean, etc., they are permissible for the ummah to make use of. A question. If Brother Suleiman had taken wudu from a utensil, a jug, which was made out of gold, the water, yes, we know, water is pure. But the vessel, the jug was made out of gold or the jug was made out of silver. And as we had learned, majority of the scholars eating, drinking and all other types of uses are also haram. 
So what would be the ruling on his wudu? Would his wudu be valid or would it be invalid? Majority of the scholars are of the opinion and iteration from the madhab of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal that this person's wudu is valid but he is sinful for using this golden vessel, this golden jug. There is another narration from Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal which states that this person is similar to the person who performs salah on a piece of earth which had been misappropriated, which had been stolen from someone. And that person's salah is invalid. Similar here, when you take wudu from a vessel which was haram, then your wudu would also be invalid. Why? Because you have clashed ibadah, getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with something which is haram, and so ibadah, which is mixed with haram, invalidates the entire ibadah. And that's one of the narrations from Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, whereas majority of the scholars the person, his salah would be valid, but he would be sinful for making use of this golden jug and performing wudu from this jug. The author continues, وَاسْتِعْمَالْ awani أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ And the usage of the utensils of the people of the book, the Ahl al-Kitab, the Jews and the Christians, وَثِيَابَهُمْ And their clothing, their garments, مَا لَمْ تُعْلَمْ نَجَاسَتُهَا It is also permissible for as long as we do not know that there is any najasa on it. For as long as you cannot see any najasa in that utensil of the Ahl al-Kitabi, for as long as you cannot see any najasa on the garment that he gifted to you, etc., it would be permissible for you to make use of it. It is permissible, no problem in the matter. Walhamdulillah. Likewise, the usage of vessels of the people of the book and the clothing, unless they are known to be impure. Prophet wasallam many a times, he would accept the invitation of the Ahl al-Kitab. He would accept the invitation of the Jew, as found in Sahih al-Bukhari. We, we find that in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the companions say, that we continue to go out in battle, and whatever of the booty we achieve, from the enemy, there would be cups, there would be utensils, etc. And we would eat in it, we would drink in it without any problem whatsoever. As long as, as long as there is no visible najasa in it or on it. We also find in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, they took wudu from a utensil which had water in it. What type of utensil? This was a leather type of utensil, a leather bag. And this female, she was a mushrik. So her people, etc., they might have slaughtered this animal un-Islamically. It was not slaughtered, the proper Islamic slaughter. They were mushriks. But this hide of this animal underwent the tanning process. And the Messenger sallallahu and his companions, they took wudu and they used the water from this utensil. Walhamdulillah. So if you go into the marketplace, you enter the souk, whatever type of garments they might be available there, made in China, made in America, wherever it might be, totally permissible for you to make use of them. You go and buy some crockery, some plates, some uh, tumblers, etc. All permissible, wherever it might have originated. Basic rule, halal until proven otherwise. Basic rule, pure until proven otherwise. Then the author continues, وَصُوفُ الْمَيْتَةِ وَشَعْرُهَا طَاهِرٌ وَكُلُّ جِلْدِ مَيْتَةٍ دُبِغَ أَوْ لَمْ يُدْبَغْ فَهُوَ نَجِسْ وَكَذَلِكَ عِظَامُهَا وَكُلُّ مَيْتَةٍ نَجِسْ إِلَّا الْآدَمِينَ We will stop there insha'Allah. The author says, وَصُوفُ وَصُوفُ الْمَيْتَةِ وَشَعْرُهَا طَاهِرٌ The will of dead animals and their hair is pure. The will of dead animals and their hair is pure. Why? Why is it pure? It is pure because you do not find that, you know, this proper type of life found within this, type, within this will or within these hairs. The meaning of that is, when you go to the barber shop, for example, when you go to the salon, when the person trims your hair, do you feel any pain? Is there any sensitivity when the person cuts off your hair? No, you don't feel anything of the sort. Similar with regards to this sheep and with regards to any type of animal, whether it be a halal animal, whether it be a haram animal, except obviously the dog and the pig, those are exceptions to the matter. This animal, let's say for example the goat, let's say for example the sheep, it and we found it dead somewhere. 
the will of the sheep can we cut it off and make use of it the answer is yes why because there is no life in that will it's it is different from example the hide of the cow the hide of the cow it is on and it is attached to the animal directly attached to the animal the sensitivity found in the matter whereas the will when you cut it off whether the animal was alive, whether the animal was dead, there is no feeling that the animal, there is no pain that the animal feels when you are cutting off the wool. وَصُوفُ الْمَيْتَةِ وَشَعْرُهَا طَاهِرٌ And the wool and the hair of these animals, dead or alive, it is pure. Walhamdulillah. وَكُلُّ جِلْدِ مَيْتَةٍ دُبِغَ أَوْ لَمْ يُدْبَغْ فَهُوَ نَجِسٌ and then something very important every hide of non slotted dead animals whether it has been tanned or not it is filthy it is najis and likewise their bones this matter subhanallah there are about seven opinions from the scholars on this matter we have a goat which was found dead somewhere can i take the hide of this animal tan it and then would it be permissible for me to make use of what about this cow? It was not slaughtered Islamically. The shoes that you buy in the marketplace, leather coming from Italy. Was there someone in Italy who was slaughtering these animals Islamically? No. So this animal was butchered to death. It was slaughtered, whatever means, it was electrocuted. But then the hide of the animal, the leather of the animal, underwent the tanning process. Dubira underwent the tanning process. Now that they've made it into the shoe, can you make use of it? Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal says, no, you cannot. And that's one narration from him. And that's the Hanbali Madhab. They say, you can only make use of the leather which has come from halal animals. Not just halal, but rather it was slaughtered Islamically also. Two conditions. It must be a halal animal. And number two, it must be slaughtered Islamically. Seven opinions in the matter and the proof of Imam, of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is a hadith recorded by Imam Ahmed and in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood that Abdullah ibn Ukain he states a letter came to us from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about a month or two before he passed away لا تستمتعوا من الميتة بإحاب that you cannot benefit from the meta from a dead animal with its hide you cannot benefit from this dead animal with regards to its hide. Dead animal, a goat found dead somewhere. A goat, not slaughtered the Islamic slaughter. A cow, a camel, not slaughtered the Islamic slaughter. You cannot benefit from it, from its leather. And this hadith recorded by Imam Ahmed and Abu Dawood in his Sunan. But there is a lot of debate with regards to the authenticity of this hadith. And number two, what is meant by ihab? Many a scholar has stated that what is meant here, it is leather before it undergoes the tanning process. And everybody agrees on that. You found a dead goat somewhere, you cannot make use of its leather, you cannot make use of its hide, or a cow which was found dead somewhere, or was not slaughtered Islamically, you cannot make use of its hide before it undergoes the tanning process. Everyone agrees on that point. And this hadith, Imam At-Tirmidhi states that Imam Ahmed, before passing away, he made ruju upon this hadith and upon this opinion that he later left this opinion and he chose another opinion. And the middle opinion in the matter is that all halal animals, whether slaughtered Islamically or not, after undergoing the tanning process, their hides would be permissible for us to make use of. And the proof for that is found in the hadith recorded by Imam Al-Nasai and Imam Ahmed that dibaghuha zakatuha that the tanning process takes the place of slaughter. Tanning process takes the place of slaughter. Dibaguha, the tanning of the animal, zakatuha, is equal to its slaughter. And that's the middle opinion in the matter, insha'Allah. You have various opinions. You have some like the Zahiri scholars that ayyuma iha bin dubikh for any type of leather, any type of hide which undergoes the tanning process would be permissible for you to make use of it. This is a very general hadith and this hadith recorded by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. So the Zahiri scholars took this hadith 
Prophet wasallam said any type of animal after undergoing the tanning process, even if it be the pig, would be permissible for us to make use of, even the dog, etc. Then you had other scholars who said, no, the pig and the dog are exceptions, various opinions. Middle opinion, safest opinion, insha'Allah, is that only halal animals, whether slaughtered Islamically or not, after undergoing the tanning process, their hides would be permissible for you to make use of, and the proof, hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed and Sunan of Imam al-Nasai, dibaghuha zakatuha, that its tanning is similar to its slaughter, walhamdulillah. So the hides of, for example, the lion, the cheetah, all of these would not be permissible. Snake skin, not permissible. Crocodile, not permissible. Only animals which are halal, whether slaughtered Islamically or not, would be permissible for us to make use of. Walhamdulillah. Then the author continues. Likewise are their bones. The bones of these animals, not permissible for us to make use of them. And there is a little bit of khilaf, a little bit of difference of opinion in the matter. And we say that if it is an animal which was halal, then it would be permissible bi idhnillahi ta'ala. The author continues, And every dead body is filthy. It is najis except. The proof for the general ruling is that Allah states in the Quran, Hurrimat alaykum al it has been made haram for you, every dead object. It is meta, it is carrion, it is haram. And that's in Surah Ma'idah. So that's the general rule. Are there exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions. What are those exceptions? Number one, the author says, إِلَّا adami, Except the human being. The human being, when he passes away or when she passes away, is the body najis? No, the body is not najis. Someone might counter-argue, well, I think it is najis. That's why we have to give the body a ghusl. Well, technically, ya ikhwan, ya akhawat, if the body was najis, then giving it a ghusl will not remove that najasa. The body is najis. If you wash a dog 20 times, does it make it pure? It does not make it pure. If you found a dead, dead goat lying down somewhere, and you washed it a million times, would it make it pure? It would not make it pure. So the human body, it is not najis even after passing away. And proofs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has stated, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ And we have elevated Bani Adam. And that's in Surah Isra and verse number 70. Verse number 70. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have ever elevated the son of Adam. It would be... The opposite of elevation of karam of uh, ikram, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated that when the human being passes away, then his body is now najis. Also, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sees Abu Huraira, and Abu Huraira was in a state of naj janaba. So when he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he hid and he ducked away, he took a ghusl and came back. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, Ya Abu Huraira, you know, why did you see me and run away? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I was in the state of Janaba. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Subhanallah, inna al-mu'min la yanjus. Subhanallah, glory be to Allah. The, this, the Muslim, the believer, he does not and he is never impure. He is never najis. What about the disbeliever? What about the kafir? The kafir, even after passing away, is also tahir. And proofs for this are that we are allowed to marry the females of the Ahl al-Kitab. We are allowed to marry women of the Ahl al-Kitab. We are allowed to sleep with them, etc. If their bodies were najis, like the Zahiri scholars have stated, they said, Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najis." Verily the disbeliever, he is najis. So this is proof. We counter-argue and we say what is meant by najasa here is that the aqidah is an aqidah of filth. As for their bodies, then it is pure, walhamdulillah. So, illa al-adami, every human being, after passing away, is still pure. Then the author continues, illa al-adami, wa hayawanu al-ma alladhi la ya'ish illa fihi. And any type of animal, any type of fish, would lives in water if it dies. So it only lives in water, so when it passes away, when it dies, then it is still tahir and it is pure. لِقَوْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فِي الْبَحْرِ Because the Prophet ﷺ said with regards to the ocean, with regards to the water, 
huwa tahur ma uhu huwa tahur not what tahur but rather huwa tahur it is pure and purifying ma uhu al hillu maytatuhu its water is pure and purifying and its dead is also permissible for you to make use of it is permissible for you to consume wa ma la nasdahu sa'ila then the author goes into another exception so we saw number 1 the human being after death is still pure number two and all types of sea creatures if they only live in the sea we are not talking about reptiles live in water and live on land we are talking about animals or fish or creatures of the sea alone if they are found dead then it would be permissible for to permissible for us to consume and they are not najis other proofs we found the famous hadith of Abu Ubaidah in Sahih al-Bukhari that the companions were out on a journey and they found this massive hood, this massive fish, maybe a whale, washed upon the shore of the ocean and they ate off it. So it was found dead. Generally, Meita, we said, anything found dead, anything dead would be najis. But this is an exception to the rule. An animal, a creature of the ocean, if found dead, it is still tahir and it is halal. And those con companions consumed from it for over 15 days. And then they brought some to the Messenger وسلم, and he had also eaten from it. Two, two exceptions so far. The author continues. وَمَا لَا نَفْسَ لَهُ سَائِلَ وَمَا لَا نَفْسَ لَهُ سَائِلَ وَمَا لَا And that which does not have نَفْس لَهُ سَائِلَ What is meant by نَفْس? نَفْس is blood. And that's why the female who has given birth and now she has this bleeding, we call this نِفَاس. نَفْس نِفَاس It is the release of blood. It is bleeding. مَا لَا نَفْسْ لَهُ سَائِلَ And any type of animal, any type of insect, etc. which does not have blood, it does not have flowing blood, the fly, the mosquito, they do not have flowing blood. As long as it did not emanate from filth. So, three exceptions. The human being, fish or creatures of the ocean, and number three, those type of insects or animals if they do not have flowing blood. And the proof for that is the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in Sahih al-Bukhari has stated إِذَا وَقْعَ الذُّبَابُ فِي إِنَاءِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلْيَغْمِسْهُ ثُمَّ لِيَطْرَحُهُ That if a fly enters the drink of any one of you, then submerge this fly into your drink. If Brother Suleiman was drinking hot tea and a fly landed in his tea, what is he told to do? He is told to submerge the fly into his tea if he wants to continue drinking that tea. Because under one wing is some sort of ailment and under the other wing is the cure. So if you want to drink and you want to continue drinking your tea, submerge the fly in that drink and then throw it away. Definitely when you submerge the fly in the drink, will it not die? Yes, it would die. Would it not be najis according to our general rule? Well, according to the general rule, it should be najis because it's dead. And every dead, as Allah said in the Quran, that حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَ All types of meta carrying dead, they are haram and they would be regarded as najis. Except the fly. Based upon this hadith recorded by Imam al-Bukhari and based upon this, the scholars with Qiyas, they said, well, why is the fly not regarded as najis? Because it does not have flowing blood. So the same would apply to the spider. Same would apply to the ant. Same would apply to the mosquito. That which does not have flowing blood, then if it is found dead, if it falls on your garment, etc., you smashed it, whatever the case might be, that area is not najis and it is still pure. Walhamdulillah. The author continues and states, As long as it did not emanate from filth, as long as the mosquito, the spider, the fly, etc. was not born out of something which was najis. Maybe, for example, we found a dog lying dead somewhere. And out of the intestines of the dog, we found after a few days that some flies emanated from there. The eggs of the flies were there and they came out and they began flying everywhere. So this type of fly, the author says, will be najis. Why? Because it emanated from something which was, something which was najis. So it was, it lived on najasa. It came out of najasa. It was, it got nutrients from najasa. Its proteins, etc. were from najasa. It fed on najasa. So then it would also be najis. 
This is the opinion of the author in the matter, but we respectfully differ with the author in the matter. We say that, for example, if you had a field of crops, and you had watered these crops with something might, which have been najis, maybe there was some sewer water, etc., which fell upon this tree, and so the tree soaked and ate upon that najasa. The fruits which come off the tree, the apple, the orange, etc., is it najis? No, it's not najis. If an animal ate upon something which was najis, can you consume the animal? Yes, you can consume the animal. And here, the same with this fly, etc. We are not consuming, but we are saying that this fly is not najis, even though it was born in an area of najasa. The area of najasa does not affect itself in and of itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And with that, we come to the end of this session. Alhamdulillah, we had discussed the matters pertaining to Aniyah. General ruling with regards to utensils is that all are permissible until proven otherwise. We spoke about gold and silver utensils, the four madahib. It is haram for the male and female to use gold and silver utensils to eat or drink. And then majority of the scholars for Madahib, they also extended this tahrim, this prohibition, to all other types of usages, except jewelry for the female. We had also mentioned when it regards to the silver, there is a little bit of concession given, there is a little bit of room in that matter, based upon the fact that the Prophet wasallam he sold in his jug with some silver. We had also learned that the Prophet wasallam he had a ring out of silver. It is permissible for the male to have a ring made out of silver. It is also permissible like the Prophet wasallam and the companions, they would have a little bit of silver on their swords. So these minute amounts of silver would be permissible bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. All other types of utensils are permissible, walhamdulillah, whether it be the Ahl al-Kitab, whether it be from the Mushrikeen, if there is no najasa on it, would be permissible for us to make use of them. And we discussed the proofs of that. We had learnt that the wool and the hair of an animal, even after it was found dead, it would be permissible for us to make use of that hair and make permissible and permissible to make use of the wool. Why? Because there is no intrinsic life in it. We had learned that the opinion of the Hanbali Madhab that an animal which might be halal but was not slaughtered Islamically, it's a halal animal like the goat, but was not slaughtered Islamically, it would not be permissible for us to make use of its hide even after the tanning process. But majority of the scholars, they stated that it would be permissible and the middle opinion out of the various opinions about seven, that a halal animal whether slaughtered Islamically or not, would be permissible for us to make use of its hide, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, and we mentioned the proofs with regards to that matter. Every type of dead is carrion and najis except the human being, except creatures of the ocean, and except those type of insects, etc., which do not have flowing blood. Walhamdulillah. And bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will meet again in our third session, and we will continue the explanation of Umdatul Fiqh bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.